Okay, everyone, welcome to Hate Live Beta Podcast. Uh, still, still in beta. I'm still working out the bugs. I still got some ideas that I might want to implement in the future. So it's not fully the 100% podcast yet. Today is uh, Thursday, October 10th, 2013. I'm Dark Side Phil, the host, and welcome. Uh, we got a lot to talk about, including schedule changes, two really big issues in the gaming world right now that I'm going to want to discuss. We've got a back in the day segment coming back today. It's going to be really good uh, regarding the history of consoles that I've dealt with in my lifetime. Uh, and kind of funny how sometimes things from the past seem to still creep up with these new consoles. And uh, you're going to see it's going to be a pretty interesting uh, kind of retrospective on console hardware as a whole. Uh, we're going to be doing the live Q&A where all during the stream tonight we will actually be uh, accepting questions all right, for the Q&A session. All right? So right now if you're in the stream chat and watching this live on Twitch... You just type an exclamation point. You know, the, not, don't type out exclamation point in letters. I'm talking about type an exclamation point, the word raffle, a space, and then your question. And you'll get those questions submitted into the raffle. Please, no duplicate questions. Do not ask the same question more than once, but you may ask different questions. If you want to ask more than one, that's okay. At the third and final segment of this show, we'll be drawing those questions randomly from the stream chat. And I'll be answering them live here on Hate Live. Okay? So... We got a lot to talk about. Let's jump right into it. First of all, what I want to do is review what I've been doing this past week and what I'll be doing now for the next week because I actually finally solidified my schedule as of today, as of when I'll be taking some more time off, when Leanna's coming to visit, what we're going to be doing, etc., etc., etc. Okay? All right. So, uh, my schedule. What have I been doing this past week, first of all? Uh, this past week has been a kind of a mishmash of different things. Mostly because of one of the sub subjects we're going to talk about in tonight's Hate Life podcast, Grand Theft Auto Online, basically kind of flopping on its own face and being a pretty unreliable kind of a failure, I would almost call it. Uh, originally, what I would plan to do is last week when Grand Theft Auto Online was Grand Theft Auto Line, Grand Theft Auto Online was released. I was going to play it for a few days, do Suicide Kings this past weekend, all right, and I was going to take up a lot of my time, and then I was planning on doing Kingdom Hearts. And then starting Wind Waker, HD, and of course Beyond Two Souls this week. But what ended up happening was Grand Theft Auto Online just didn't work. It really literally didn't work for, for multiple days at a time to the point where now it still really doesn't work. You can get on now. There's no problem locking on. But it randomly lags you out of the server. People keep losing their characters over and over. Howard actually tweeted today. And he tweeted, he said, G Rockstar, thanks for bringing back my character who for some reason you deleted a few days earlier. But... Thanks for changing the appearance. The character came back and looked completely different from the character that Howard had created. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. Um, so because of that, I haven't really played GTA Online at all. I played it tw I attempted to play it twice, only really got one session in, and I haven't gotten to play it again since then because it just it hasn't worked. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you in the, the schedule how we're going to factor this in and because we are doing Suicide Kings this weekend, so fingers crossed we can at least get on and it won't drop us nonstop, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so what did I do this past week? Well, because GTA Online was basically a flop, uh, I did a few things. I started, well, I, I continued Kingdom Hearts Final Mix, and I do want to say very special thanks to everyone involved for me resuming that playthrough. So we're talking Lord Dark Soul and uh, McIntyre, who both uh, played through the game themselves and created a save file for me to use. Unfortunately, Lord Dark Souls wasn't working, I think because it was a British file, it was from the UK, uh, McIntyre's did, and so I also want to thank Solid Fantasy, who used some kind of hacking software to hack that game save and change it over to my account, so I was able to continue the playthrough pretty much from where I left off, and pretty much with equivalent stats and everything from where I had left off before my PlayStation 3 died a month ago, and I had to basically indefinitely suspend the playthrough because I had no way to get my save file. So... In the future, what I'll be doing is I will actually be using the cloud to save my games on PS3. So if this ever happens again, I don't lose all my game files, okay? I'll do the same thing on PS4 as well. It just makes sense to continue this tradition, okay? So I did manage to play through and finish Kingdom Hearts Final Mix this week. And the playthrough is live on DSP Gaming for anyone who hasn't seen it or missed it. Now... My final thoughts on the game are this, because I didn't review it. The game is old. Why would I review a game from 2002 or whatever year it actually came out? My thoughts on the game are this. I loved it. I loved the, the all the cameos from the classic Disney characters. I loved the special appearances by Final Fantasy characters. The game obviously had a heavy Final Fantasy influence. I loved the mishmash of it. 
if only the only thing I have to say, the one thing I honestly disliked about the game is the final chapter. That final stage is such a repetitive, annoying grind, especially that final gauntlet of enemies before you get to the last boss. Here's, here's what I would have seen. All right, so there's a really long gauntlet of enemies and then a final boss, end the game. Perfect ending, right? Or there is no gauntlet of enemies, but then you get to the final boss and you fight a form after form after form. It's really dramatic and well done. All right, that would have been fine. But what they decided to do was do an insanely long gauntlet of enemies followed by an insanely long gauntlet of boss fights. Six different forms of the final boss. The final the final stage could be done in, in like 45 minutes. Instead, it took me over like two hours to beat this game because if you die at certain points, it actually doesn't even save a checkpoint and you have to restart do certain fights over and over. That gauntlet of enemies, if you die anywhere near it, you have to start over. That's 15 minutes of gameplay you lose, which is literally what happened to me. I was on the final group of enemies and I died. I was like, fuck, now I gotta replay 15 minutes. And the same thing with the boss fight. If you lose at certain points in the boss fight, you have to replay stages of the boss fight, and it just takes so long to get through. That was the only negative I actually have to say about the game. Everything else about the game, I actually quite enjoyed. The HD remix, in my opinion, was done very well. The graphics blew me away. I thought it looked great. And, uh, you know, the, it really brought the cartoon characters to life in the 3D realm that uh, I thought it was well done. So, Kingdom Hearts Final Mix, definitely like the game. If they do do a you know two, Kingdom Hearts 2 HD remix in the future, I'll consider doing it. I'm not definitely saying I'm 100% I'm going to do it. I'm saying that I would consider it because I actually did like Part 1, okay? Okay. So in addition to that, I actually did also start The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD. Now, I only played it a few days. I actually played it, I believe it was Sunday, Monday. No, I didn't play it Monday. I think I played it... I take that back. I played it Saturday, Sunday, and then I just played it today. All right. So I'm about, I think I'm about 40-something parts into the playthrough. It feels like Zelda. It really does. Uh, similar to how when I, when I played Skyward Sword a couple years ago, how Skyward Sword, to transition between the different stages, you had to fly around. In this game, you're on the sea. So it's kind of a very similar aspect. I think the graphics, again, that they did really well with the HD upgrade of the graphics. All these HD re-releases this, this past couple of months have been really good. And uh, I'm liking it. I really do like Zelda Wind Waker. Uh, I know it's insanely long. Because people are saying it's really long. I know. Uh, as I said, I actually said this on the stream today. I have about eight days to beat the game. Uh, and as long as I'm playing at least one major stream of Wind Waker every one of those days, I think that I will beat it by the end of that time frame. Okay? Um, so I'm playing that. I played that a few times. And of course, the big release this week, the one that everyone was waiting for, Beyond Two Souls, the latest game from Quantic Dream, the people who made Heavy Rain and Indigo Prophecy, was released this week to ridiculously polarizing opinions and reviews. Some people are saying they hate the game, they're so disappointed, they loved Heavy Rain, but this game they just didn't get for for certain different reasons, which we're going to talk about actually, uh, coming up once I'm finished talking about my schedule. And other people love this, and this is great, I love it, great story, this could be a game of the year contender for me. So it's funny when a game like this comes out and it's such completely differing opinions, and we're going to talk about that, alright? So I did beat Beyond Two Souls in two days. I basically went into marathon mode, and both streams for those days were Beyond Two Souls. The playthrough, I believe, is going to finish around like 58 parts, which is only ending just a few sh parts shorter than my Heavy Rain playthrough. However, what you got to remember is that with Heavy Rain, I actually failed a bit and had to go back and redo certain parts. It was I remember there was like one video of 20 minutes that I just kept fucking failing over and over at this one part of the game, and I didn't want it to go down like that, so I had to keep replaying it until I finally passed it, okay? Um, so that playthrough is complete. I have not yet reviewed that game. We're going to talk about that right now because now what we're going to do is I'm going to get you up to speed on what's going on with for the next several days because the schedule has changed. There's been some announcements this week, things that I didn't even expect, no one expected, and they just came out of the blue. The big announcement is that the next game from Telltale Games, okay, which is that, that game company that released the episodic Walking Dead game last year that ended up being my pick for game of the year, all right, the new game is called The Wolf Among Us, and it comes out tomorrow. Now, everyone is like, what? 
It was crazy. Like, I was sitting here playing Beyond Two Souls on Tuesday, and all of a sudden people started typing in the stream chat, uh, what the hell is this? The Wolf Among Us comes out Friday. Now, no one knew this. We knew it was supposed to come out. First of all, it was supposed to come out during the summer. Then it got delayed. Then they said it was going to be in the fall, but they didn't say when. Then finally they admitted, all right, we're going to try to get it out in October. Then all of a sudden, with only a couple days warning, they say, oh, by the way, it's out on Friday. So... Good news if you didn't have anything to play right now. Bad news if you don't have any time to play and you would have liked to plan when you wanted to play the game. It's coming out this Friday, okay? Uh, so episode one, anyway, because it is a five-episode adventure similar to how Walking Dead was. What's happening is they're releasing the first episode for $5, and then you can get the season pass, episodes two through five. I believe they said it was like 15 or 16 bucks. Or I think you can, at a future date, you can buy them separately, but they'll all be $5 each. So if you like episode one, it makes sense to just get the season pass. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm going to be checking that out. I'm excited. Regardless of the fact that if it's Walking Dead or not, Telltale did a good job. I actually liked the Back to the Future game that Telltale Games made a few years back. I played that and I enjoyed it thoroughly. And I enjoyed The Walking Dead, so it's a no-brainer. Why wouldn't I check out their newest game? Even though it's about, like, it's basically a comic book series about fables and stuff that I never heard of. But it doesn't mean that it's, I'm not going to like it. I am going to check it out uh, tomorrow. So the way that this is going to work, all right, just to give everyone a heads up, Right now, I'm filming Hate Live. After this, I'm going to actually upload this to uh, the King of Hate Vlogs. And as soon as that's done, I'm going to upload the conclusion of Beyond Two Souls to DSP Gaming overnight. So that's going to go live overnight. Tomorrow, Friday, first stream is going to be Wind Waker HD. Second stream is going to be The Wolf Among Us, Episode 1. Okay? That's tomorrow. And all those videos will be uploading to DSP Gaming. Saturday, finally, we're going to attempt it. I don't know. I can't make any promises to anyone. But we're, John and I are going to attempt to do Suicide Kings in Grand Theft Auto Online. So John's going to be here. He's going to have a setup right here. I'm going to have my setup here. Both Xboxes will be connected to the Internet. We're going to create a private match, and we're going to invite people who want to be involved. So that's coming up on Saturday. I can't promise you a time yet because it actually depends on what time John gets here and how long it takes us to film Smart Guys. But we're going to be trying to do several lobbies over the course of Saturday where you can jump in and play with us. And what we're going to try to do is Suicide Kings. We're going to get cars and stuff. We're going to crash them together. We're going to try to get choppers. We're going to try to get everything. And I believe that some people have actually been playing Grand Theft Auto uh, online this week and they've been trying to discover the locations of things like where is the airfield with the chopper and stuff like that so we can do some crazy stuff in the game. So that's going to be this Saturday, all right? Um, and that's going to be all day. It's not just going to be one lobby of people. We'll probably try to do multiple lobbies. Now, the reason I say I can't make any promises and I don't know if it's going to work, it's this simple. People are still trying to play Grand Theft Auto Online, and they're still getting logged out when they're playing. They're still having their characters get deleted, and they're di disappearing, reappearing, disappearing, reappearing. For our purposes, I don't think we really give a shit about what characters are unlocked, because we're just going to explore the free roam, all right? But that being said, it'd be pretty fucking annoying if when we're trying to play, it keeps dropping us from the server, and we have to recreate another room, re-invite people again. It might be a huge hassle, so here's hoping that on Saturday the fucking thing works. I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the woes and stuff that people have been having in a minute when I'm done talking about my schedule, okay? So that's Saturday, which leaves me with Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday available for gaming because on Wednesday, my girlfriend Leanna Pandalee will be visiting me again. All right, for the first time, I'm sorry, for the last time for over a month, which is why she's visiting again so soon. I know she was only here just two weeks ago, but she's here this quickly again for a particular reason, okay? So, what this means is that I have three days, every day I'll be playing Wind Waker, at least one stream. But my goal here would to be not to be playing Wind Waker nonstop those three days, especially because I know there's some people, you know, maybe already played Wind Waker, maybe it doesn't appeal to you, you like a different style of game. So it's going to be my goal to try to do some variety in content. So probably what I'll do is I'm going to split my content to entertain you with different stuff. So maybe Sunday, I'm probably going to do Wind Waker and I'm going to do a different stream. And I haven't decided exactly what it'll be on Sunday, but it's going to be one of these options. It's either going to be the return to Beyond Two Souls. And what I mean by that is Beyond Two Souls is a game where the way it's broken up, it's in chapters. And you can replay chapters and do them completely differently than the first way you did. And it can actually unlock whole new parts of the story. So, for example, there was one chapter in the game where I screwed up. I was trying to sneak out and do something against the will of the people who were watching me. And I screwed up and the chapter just ended. But I found out that if you fool them, you can actually sneak out and this whole new scene happens. So there's m multiple things like that in the game that I want to try. In addition, the game has so 23 different endings, supposedly. 
Uh, and I only got, you know, two of them so far. I want to replay the end of the game and get maybe three or four more endings for this final choice in the game. So I'm going to be doing that on a search stream coming up in the next few days, Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, all right? In addition to that, I'm actually thinking that one day I may play some Fallout 3. I know it's been a long time now since I played Fallout 3. Actually, I'm thinking about it. It might be more than a month. I'm not positive on that. And being that it is a playthrough that it, did, it has a small dedicated viewership, but I don't, I, I'm, I'm liking it. I don't want to stop. I'm actually in the middle of a DLC right now. I'm in, I'm in Mothership Zeta, which I didn't even finish. And I do actually want to go back to it. Okay? So... I am going to be uh, probably doing a stream of Fallout 3 in the next few days. And, last but not least, I am probably going to be doing a session of fighting games. I have not done a session of fighting games in a long time. Mostly because, number one, I've just been busy with other stuff. Number two, there hasn't been an Injustice DLC released recently. I was actually surprised that they released that last DLC character, Zatanna, and there hasn't been any word of another one after that, even though I heard that there are rumblings there will be more. Uh, there hasn't been anyone after that, which is kind of weird, right? Um, and so I haven't gone back to Injustice to play. I haven't played Street Fighter in a long time. So I'm probably going to be going back and doing some fighting games. I'm not promising you what, which ones. I Definitely there'll be Street Fighter. I always go to the staples. You know, Street Fighter is always a staple. But I'm not sure what, what day that will be, but that is coming up as well. So that's, that's the plan. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday is going to be Wind Waker paired with other stuff. So you get variety in, in what the videos that are coming out rather than you just getting the same shit every single day and you get bored of it. All right? Now, as I said, my girlfriend Leanna will be visiting me this Wednesday of next week. But that means that there will be no hate live next week. Okay? No hate live podcast at all. But she'll be visiting and there are going to be a couple days in there where I think we're going to play some games together. It's the first time we've done this in a while actually. Uh, and being that it is October... We're in the festive spirit of Halloween. You see people are putting out their Halloween decorations. Everyone's gearing up in a few weeks for Halloween. Last year, we really didn't even have a Halloween because we had a fucking hurricane that knocked out the power for a week. So people are in Halloween mode. We're going to play uh, a Halloween-themed game together uh, with co-op commentary. And now it's a game that I don't know if we're going to get very far in. From what I've heard, the game is incredibly long, uh, incredibly drawn out. Uh, but it is something that my girlfriend wanted to check out. Uh, she, it's one of her, it's, it's a game that she likes, and, uh, I said, okay, let's do it. I've never played it. I've never played any game in the series, and, uh, I don't know if I should reveal what it is right now or not. Maybe I'll reveal it in the week in preview this week, but it is a horror-themed game that we will be playing this week on a couple streams. So there will be some video footage, even when I have time off, of gameplay. It's gonna be a, a horror-themed game that we're gonna do co-op commentary in, okay? And yes, you hit it right on the nose, Pony Po, it's gonna be Hannah Montana. There you go. That's the game we're playing. Hannah Montana. All right. Phew. Okay. Um, so, that's what's going to be going on that next week. And then uh, she's actually going to return back home that Monday following. So, that would be a week from this Monday. Okay. And then what I've got coming up then is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, three days before the release of Batman Arkham Origins. And what I'll probably be doing is, if I haven't finished it yet, I'll be continuing with Wind Waker, which I guarantee you I probably will not have beaten Wind Waker by then. And I'll be trying, again, I'll be trying to pair it with other stuff. So, depending on what I'm doing, depending on how far I've gotten in certain stuff, maybe I'll do some more GTA Online at that point, because it'll be in been a couple weeks. Maybe I'll need more footage to try to put together Suicide Kings. We're going to see what happens with that, okay? But those three days are just kind of going to be more Wind Waker and more stuff until finally that Friday, Batman Arkham Origins, and then that's it. That's overload. Once that Friday hits, you got Batman. That Tuesday, you've got the release of three major games, Assassin's Creed and all that, near the end of the month. Uh, the week after that, you got Call of Duty. The week after that, you've got the PlayStation 4. The week after that, you've got the Xbox One. And that's going to roll us out till the end of the year with the Stick of Truth, uh, for South Park, the Stick of Truth coming out in December. It's just going to be gaming overload, and I'm going to be so busy playing great games. That's the thing. I don't mind being that busy because I'm going to be playing great games and enjoying them, and that's what it's all about. This is the best time of year for gamers, and I'm very excited, okay? So I just gave you kind of a roughly a schedule rundown for the next several weeks so you guys are in the know on what's going on, okay? Now, the one thing I didn't mention, I actually did mention for the people who were on the stream before I started the podcast tonight, but however, I want to mention it now. If you are watching the podcast live, I want to uh, let you know that after I stop recording the podcast tonight on Twitch TV, I'm going to do an exclusive screening of an awesome montage video that P-Dog, who is 
a chat moderator. He is a longtime viewer and fan of mine. Uh, put together. And he had, I had the privilege of taking a look at this early. He sent it to me a day or two ago. It is an awesome montage of classic DSP. Basically, in the year 2010, before I made a dime doing any videos or anything like that on YouTube, there was a lot of cool stuff that went on. And this video is cool for two reasons. Number one, it's actually really cool because if you're a longtime viewer and fan of mine, it's an awesome nostalgic feeling. When I watched it, I was like, wow, I remember that stuff that was so fun. It's really cool to look back at the past and, and, uh, and see how far you've come since, you know, in three years, how much I, the content has has developed and evolved and it's like wow look where I am now compared to where I was three years ago but in addition this is a cool look back for people who maybe aren't longtime fans and viewers who weren't back weren't watching me back in 2010 when I was back on the original dark side Phil channel on YouTube and this is a way for you to experience that and see some of the coolest things from that uh, in a montage kind of a, a video and it was really well done a lot of hard work I could tell P-Dog put into it we're gonna be doing a screening of this video after the podcast ends tonight so if you're watching this on Twitch TV when the podcast ends don't go anywhere all right because I'm gonna do an exclusive streaming uh, streaming an exclusive s screening of this video if you're watching this podcast on YouTube in the description of the video right now I've put a link to P-Dog's montage video so you can just click that and watch it at your leisure okay so definitely give it a look. All right. So now, now that we're transitioning over to the next segment, where we're going to talk about the two hottest topics in gaming this week. Okay. Wait, people, did I say two thousand six? People in the stream chat are saying he said two. I've been here since two thousand six. All right. I guess I miss. I misspoke. <laughs> I meant to say twenty ten. Um, oh, this fell. So, the two hottest things going on with gaming this week. The first one is what we already mentioned, Grand Theft Auto Online. So let's really discuss this. All right, so Grand Theft Auto V came out mid-September. And huge critical acclaim. Let's face it, everyone who played the game pretty much fucking loved it. And it had an amazing amount of content, very long campaign. To the point where so many people are like, this is this is game of the year. All right. Now I'm not saying that for me that it's my game of the year. I'm just saying I, I agree. There's a kind of a consensus among gamers. It's an exceptionally good game. All right. But this is the first time really where Rockstar decided to stagger the release of something in a game. All right. So this Grand Theft Auto Online is basically a game mode in Grand Theft Auto V that is completely separate from the single player campaign, even though it takes place in the same map of San Andreas, or Los Santos, or whatever the hell you want to call it, okay, um, and it was, it was advertised like that, like, GTA Online, GTA Online is a different experience from GTA 5, it's going to have its own mini campaign, a series of quests and things you're going to do online, you can either do them separately or cooperatively, free-flowing, open roaming, you know, at any time, 16 players can go all around the map, they can interact with each other if they want, they can choose not to interact with each other if they don't want, it's completely up to them, okay, and so, uh, Everyone knew. He said, listen, this game sold so much, it made, they made a billion dollars in three days. It's an unprecedented, best-selling game, uh, you know, quickest-selling game of all time. I can't say best-selling because we don't know yet over time how much it'll sell, but it's the quickest-selling game. They made the most money in the shortest amount of time. What's going to happen when they turn Grand Theft Auto Online on on October 1st? And I speculated fully it was going to be a disaster. It wouldn't work. It was going to explode. The servers would crash. There would be a huge problem. And some people said, no, it's Rockstar North. They're good. You should trust them. And I was like, yeah, right. Whenever in the history of video games has there been the launch of a multiplayer-focused game where the launch window, it worked perfectly. I, I can't think of one. All right, I really can't even think of one. So I knew there was going to be issues, and of course that's exactly what happened. Day one, most people could not log in. If they were lucky enough to even connect with a server, they got to this first tutorial mission that was supposed to teach you how to race, which is dumb because why don't you just drop people into the open world, let them run around and choose to not do missions if they don't want to, so that way they can at least play. No, they forced you to do this mission first, this race, and for most people it glitched out. It glitched out for me for two straight hours until finally it did it, and then it allowed me to play Grand Theft Auto Online afterwards, okay? So, the problem is this is it, it, it really had a bad start. Really bad. For days, people couldn't even log on to the server. Then, once they fixed that initial problem, people were able to log on to the servers, but they had some crazy lingering problems. Problem number one, missions just crashing, not working properly. All right. Problem number two, your character being deleted. 
That's right. People would play for hours. One guy, I was reading people, you know, posting up on the internet about this. One guy said he played for something like 30 hours. His character had like uh, millions, a million dollars. He was like level 20 something or something like that. And he fucking character got deleted. And he's like, what the fuck? I did all, I invested all that time for what? What was the point? Okay. Uh, and I can understand that frustration. Imagine that. Sucking that amount of time, sinking that amount of time, excuse me, into something. And then pfft, like that, it's just taken away from you. That would be very frustrating, right? We, I'd be fucking pissed. In addition to that, there's people who are logging in and playing and they're just getting dropped from the server nonstop. Even if they're playing by themselves. They're maybe on a server by themselves and they still get dropped, okay? So this, these lingering problems have been happening for the past week and a half. Here we are, a week and a half later, they're still happening. So a lot of people said, oh, don't worry, just give Rockstar the benefit of the doubt. Give them a few days, it'll be fine. No, it hasn't been. In fact, people are saying it's, it doesn't, I don't know, when's it going to get better? When is it actually going to be fully functional? It's obviously concerning for me because this Saturday I want to do Suicide Kings. I want to get all my viewers and fans involved and do some of the craziest open world shenanigans ever in a video game. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it two weeks after I, I, it's already launched. What the hell is going on with this online product? All right. Now, for some people, they're like, listen, listen, it's okay. Because Grand Theft Auto V was so good, the campaign was so good by itself, you got your money's worth already. And you know what? I'm going to actually agree with those people. The campaign of Grand Theft Auto V was amazing. I loved it. The amount of content, the variety of gameplay, the writing, the comedy, the stories, everything about the game, I loved it. So for me to say, oh, this game sucks because the online component doesn't work, I'd be a selfish bastard to do that. And that's wrong because the game is, a, is really a well-made game, okay? However, you do have to keep in mind, Rockstar promised there was just going to be this online component, and it doesn't really work right now the way it's supposed to. And so this has opened up a whole new can of worms when it really comes to reviews, all right? So now let's talk about it. Let's be honest here. The mainstream media, ooh, yeah, IGN and GameSpot and all those fucking outlets that get advanced copies of the game even though they fucking should in my opinion, everyone should get it on launch day, play it themselves, and then have to review it on the same day. Not, oh, I get exclusivity because I'm in a gaming media. Fuck that, right? But anyway, I digress. All these gaming media got the game ahead of time, only played the campaign because Grand Theft Auto Online didn't even launch for another two weeks, and gave the game a review. A review and a review score. So you, they were I was saying this game is a 10 out of 10 before Grand Theft Auto Online even was released, all right? And a lot of people are taking issue with that. They're like, now wait a minute. You reviewed a game based on half of the game. Because yes, the box may say Grand Theft Auto V, but you get two things in that package. You get the single player campaign of Grand Theft Auto V, and you get Grand Theft Auto Online. People have argued, oh, well, th they're two separate things. But then I propose this. Then why can't you get Grand Theft Auto li Online by itself? Hmm? Because you can't, because they're not two separate things. They are part of the same component game. So how could anyone who calls themselves a legitimate source of, of, of information review only one portion of the game and give you a review score, right? And that's the problem. If you look at websites right now like Metacritic and all that, all the review scores that you see there were based off the campaign and no one reviewed the online because it wasn't available yet. So it's a big can of worms. It's a big, it, it's, an, it's ethical an ethical faux pas. You reviewed it, but you didn't really play everything, so how can you give a legitimate review to the game? And now, some people are actually saying, well, wait, if we had waited, and we had waited until Grand Theft Auto Online came out, and we saw what a botch this has been, maybe it would have been different. Maybe you wouldn't have given it a 10, you would have given it a 9.5 and said, all right, the game's not perfect because the online mode doesn't even fucking work, but at least the campaign was outstanding 9.5 out of 10. And that would have been legitimate. Then 10 out of 10, kiss Rockstar North's ass. Here, take my money. Take all, take my billion dollars right now. Here you go. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I really think that this game kind of got steamrolled into amazing overhype and overpopularity. And now some people who bought the game primarily for the online component. I'm going to tell you something. When I was in line on launch day of Grand Theft Auto V, I was in line to prepay the game and get my number so I could go for the midnight release and get the game at midnight. There were people in line around me saying, man, I'm just getting this for the online. The online looks amazing. Grand Theft Auto Online looks fucking great. All the trailers I've seen, that looks like the game. I mean, the campaign, all right, but I'm really, I'm really interested in this online component. What about those fucking people? Those people got dicked 
Those people literally got bent over and ass fucked because everyone overhyped the fucking game, rated it tens. Everyone ran out thinking, oh, there's this awesome online component coming, and the online component barely works. All right? So there's this gray area in reviews. Should, first of all, should games be allowed to be reviewed before they hit the streets and people actually get to play them in a real environment? Should Grand Theft Auto V have been reviewed at all when you knew there was an online component that was going to take two weeks to fucking come out? So, I don't know. I'm, I can see, here's the thing. I can see both sides. And the reason I can see both sides is because I've been, I am on both sides. I am both a gamer who buys the game, but I also review the games afterwards. So I've, I'm on both sides of the fence. For me, I can see, okay, there were lots of people who wanted to know of the campaign, was it good? Is the campaign warrant a $60 purchase? And the answer is absolutely. The campaign is long, it's excellent, it's well done, it's polished. Even though there's some bugs in the game, it's not perfect. It's polished. Having three characters instead of one main character, I think, was actually a really cool feature of the game, switching between them. All the improvements they did, the graphical engine that was vastly improved, the draw distance. They, did, they made so many improvements over Grand Theft Auto 4 in this game, it was definitely worth the $60 purchase. So I don't think anyone who bought the game played the campaign and enjoyed it, has the right now to kind of stomp their feet and say, I want my $60 back. No, bullshit. You played an outstanding game. You got your money's worth, all right? But for people who bought the game just to play the online mode, I can see why they'd be furious that these game outlets reviewed the game and gave it 10 out of 10 before the online mode was even tested and it doesn't work, all right? And I'm not to say, who's to say in a month or two, maybe the online mode will work? And it'll work fine, but now you have to wait two fucking months since the launch of the game to even play a component that was promised to you two weeks after the launch of the game, and that's the problem. This is the problem with these online games, and this is the problem, and this is what I'm going to... I've talked about this before, but I want to discuss it again. Any other product on the planet that you buy, alright, just think about it. You walk into the store, and you buy this thermos. And you go home and you fill the thermos up and the bottom of the thermos fucking breaks off and spills the juice all over your crotch. It's actually coffee so now your balls are burnt, scalding, you know, second degree burns on your fucking genitals. You rush back to the store, you say, fuck you, this doesn't work, I want one that works or I want my money back. Oh, by the way, I'm suing you because the bottom fell off and I can never have sex again, alright? So that's what you would do if the thermos didn't work, right? You wouldn't say, oh, well, I bought the thermos, but maybe it'll take two weeks for the thermos to work properly. Uh, you know, maybe in a month or two, they'll fix the problem with the bottom for me, and then I won't have to worry about my balls anymore, right? Now, just think about that. That's what's going on with Grand Theft Auto Online. You bought something, you were promised it would work on a certain date, it went to that date, it doesn't fucking work. So there's a breach here. Because here's the thing, this is what the, the video game developers infamously hide behind. They say, when you buy a video game, I just happen to have Beyond Two Souls in front of me. When you buy a video game, you're not purchasing the game, you're purchasing a license. A phantom, now think about it, what the fuck is a license? It doesn't exist, it's a phantom thing. A license to play the game that's on that disc, but you don't actually own the game that's on that disc, alright? Well, let, let me ask you something, alright? I paid $60 for this video game. I can do whatever the fuck I want with it. I can smash it on the table. I can bite the disc into a million, smash it into a million pieces. I can fucking, you know, shove it up my ass. I can flush it down the fucking toilet. I can rip the game from the disc if I want. What I don't have a legal right to do is to sell this by duplicating the code on the disc. All right? That's about it. That's the only thing really I can't do. So... When I bought this, it should have worked when I bought it today. Not that, oh, you bought a license, and as long as the game boots up, we've done our part. Bullshit. That's complete cop-out. That's bullshit. Just because we're in a digital age and this is different from a thermos doesn't mean that it's not the same exchange between a customer and a game developer as, this, as the same as the, uh, the manufacturer of this thermos. If I bought the thermos, it better fucking work. When I buy the game, it better fucking work. You don't get a fucking leeway period of four months to patch the game and make the fucking game work. So for Rockstar to, be, to say stuff like that and cop out, oh, we told you there'd be problems. No, you shouldn't have ever went fucking live if you didn't know, or, you know, if you didn't fix these things. Now, arguably, from a game development standpoint, I can see this is a thing. I can see the other side of the argument as well. How are you going to simulate... A billion dollars worth of customers trying to log into your game all at the same time. How could you realistically do that? I don't know. I don't think you could. How do you simulate that capacity of people 
all trying to play at the same time. And it is a true statement that, of course, at launch, there's more hype for something than later on. And so three, four weeks from now, there'll probably be significantly less amount of people trying to play Grand Theft Auto Online because, let's face it, people get tired of it, people saw what it is, maybe got bored of it, people moved on to other games. That's going to happen inevitably. But... To be irresponsible enough to sell a billion dollars worth of something in three days and then not say, oh, fuck, okay, we really got to take this seriously and make sure this shit works, I think was irresponsible on Rockstar North's part, okay? And now everyone's questioning, will Grand Theft Auto Online actually fully work at any time or will it always have these problems where people are dropping off and such? Because let's face it, today is, is Thursday a week and a half after when it was promised it would work. There's probably one-fourth of the amount of people trying to play Grand Theft Auto Online now than there were past Tuesday on October 1st. Why the fuck are characters still getting deleted and people still getting kicked from servers? Makes no fucking sense, okay? So all their reasonings and their bullshit trying to defend themselves, it's not legit. Now, I myself have held off from reviewing Grand Theft Auto V because I want to give you a real review of the game. I don't want to say... This is the review of the campaign, and this I'll do a separate video later for Grand Theft Auto Online. No. You paid $60, you got two products for $60. One works, one doesn't. That should be factored into a review. Now, it doesn't mean that I won't split it up and say the campaign is great and the online doesn't work, but it's bullshit that these reviewers basically did that. They didn't do that. They say they just reviewed the campaign and gave it a score, and it's out there for the world to see. It's bullshit. They didn't review the game. They reviewed half the game. So, I just wanted to get that issue out there. I just want to let everyone know that in the next several days, after I play Suicide Kings this Saturday, I will be doing a review of Grand Theft Auto V. It's coming up. It's going to be before I take my time off this week. I'm going to be reviewing it. I'm also going to be reviewing Beyond Two Souls. That's coming up. I want to do, play some of the additional content of that game Excuse me, before I actually review it. So, there are going to be two Hateful Truth reviews coming up in the next week. And this is the first time since Jesus... June, I think. Deadpool was the last one that I reviewed. So it's a long time coming. I've finally got reviews on the way. Okay, everybody? Okay. Now let's talk about the other big thing in gaming this week. The big source of controversy. I just held it up. Beyond Two Souls, the latest game from Quantic Dream from the mind of David Cage. The guy that brought you Heavy Rain, Indigo Prophecy. Um, Beyond Two Souls has been a long time in development. It's been over two years they've been developing this game. Okay. And it's one of the very first times where I've seen a game actually star movie and TV actors. Now, not to say that people who do voice acting for video games don't do a great job and they're not considered real actors. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that these are two renowned, well-known actors who they cast into the main roles of this game. They even made the characters look like them. They did motion, facial recognition and motion capture of these actors when they made the game. And... It is extremely polarizing. Right now, everyone's got an opinion on Beyond Two Souls. And really, I don't I haven't heard anyone say there's a middle ground. I've heard this game is extremely disappointing. It's nowhere near as good as Heavy Rain was, uh, you know, for various reasons, and they don't they don't like it. And then on the other side, I've heard this game is amazing. It's one of my favorite games of the year. It may be my game of the year contender. I've heard these two. And I haven't heard anyone kind of say, eh, okay, middle ground, it's good, but it's not amazing. You know, and it's weird that you can have such a dichotomy of opinions on one thing that's the same exact game, okay? Now, what I'm here to tell you are my initial impressions of the game before I officially review it, uh, is that the game is about a narrative. It's here to tell you a story. It's People would, would argue that this game isn't a game, that it's just an interactive movie, all right? Well, interactivity is what separates a movie from a game. That's the whole point. You know what I mean? A movie is unchanging. A movie will not progress after you... Pre I mean, it will progress after you press the play button. That's your only interactivity. It's never going to change. A movie will never change and have different scenes and things in it. This will based on your inputs with your controller. All right? So... The game has extremely limited gameplay. I'm not going to lie to anyone about that, all right? It's extremely limited, the amount of inputs that you do. In fact, a lot of the times, you can even make mistakes, do wrong inputs, and the game just keeps going. It's not like you die and the game ends a lot. The game is extremely forgiving. I played the Beyond Two Souls. The only time in the game that I ever failed was at the very end. 
the last chapter, if you fuck up too much, you actually die and the game ends. Alright? That's the only time in the game. There's other times in the game, there's plenty of times I fucked up. The game said, oh well, so you got hurt maybe a little bit, just keep going. Just roll with it. And there's people basically saying that in certain parts of the game, you just, you can't die. You can fail, 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 and you'll still survive. Alright? So, it really seems to me that what Quantic Dream was going for was a movie or a story, a narrative. I think uh, in what you should really call this is an interactive narrative. The story of Jody, who is a, a girl who has this entity that's attached to her, and because of that, she gets all these amazing powers and how her life develops, how that affects her relationships with other people. Imagine trying to have a boyfriend when you have this entity connected to you that actually interferes with stuff. Just think about that. Gets jealous. Um, the fact that she... You know, she gets trained to actually be a field operative for the uh, for a certain branch of the armed forces and how they use her for different things. There's a crazy supernatural aspect to the game. I'm just giving you views very broad. I'm not giving you specifics to ruin the plot. But it's basically the story of her life, all right? And if you're into the story, if you like the story, you'll probably think this is one of the Game of the Year contenders for this year. But I could totally see if you're the kind of person that you're not really heavily in the story. You like gameplay. You like getting hours and hours of gameplay out of your game. You're not going to like this game. Because you're going to say, oh, there's, it's so limited in the amount of gameplay and the actual interactivity. And a lot of the times, like I said, the things that you do don't even affect the game. Oh no, I fucked up the input. Well, you didn't die. You just The game just kept going even though you fucked up. And I can understand why a lot of people are disappointed in that. In Heavy Rain, if you fucked up too much, your character would die and that would it. The game would progress on without that character and you'd be like, fuck, I really screwed the pooch. I killed that character by accident. All right? So I can understand why people think that it's different from Heavy Rain. But now some of the things that I've seen that are negatives are ridiculous too. I've seen people say, the story doesn't make sense to me, so I don't like it. Like... Well, did you pay attention to the game? Because I paid attention and I understood everything about the story. At the end of the game, everything gets wrapped up. You understand everything about the game. And it's like, what didn't they get? Were they fucking, you know, were they over here texting during the cutscenes of the game? And gee, maybe that's why they didn't know what the fuck's going on. Well, did he die? I can understand why when you reviewed it, you say you didn't understand the plot. I just don't get that at all. Um, some people are getting saying the game is too short. I'm here to tell you that's a cop-out because the game is just about as long as... As Heavy Rain was. My playthrough of Heavy Rain was 63 parts long. My playthrough of Beyond Two Souls is going to be 58 parts long. So you're talking, what, a half an hour to 45 minutes extra that was in Heavy Rain? And really, when you think about it, in my Heavy Rain playthrough, I died only a few times. And so when I died those few times, it extended the length of the playthrough. Like I said, in this game, I only died once. So really, they're about the same length. So people complaining, oh, it's too short, it's nowhere near as long as Heavy Rain, they're blatantly lying to you. They didn't go back and actually look to see how long Heavy Rain is. This is about the same length as Heavy Rain, and I'm not complaining that the game's not long enough. I think that it was a good length. It covers a long, winding story of the, co the character Jody's life from her childhood all the way up to when she's, uh, you know, mid-20s, all the crazy stuff that happens to her. Now, one gripe that people seem to have, okay, is that the game doesn't play linear. It doesn't go from when she's a kid to when she's older. It actually jumps around. So you'll have one chapter, she's young, then she's older, then she's younger, then she's older, maybe she's here, she's here, she's here. And it kind of, it, it confuses things a little bit. But if you actually get a certain ending of the game, they explain why it's like that. So there's actually a legitimate reason why the game is like that. It's part of the artistic direction of the game tying into the story. But again, I guarantee you the game reviewers who were saying that I don't like that didn't get that ending or weren't paying fucking attention to pick up on why the game does that. There's a reason for it. And it makes fucking sense. It ties in with the game. Okay? So... All I have to really say is when you read game reviews, you got to take them with a grain of salt. All right. You got to understand the perspective of the reviewer. If you read the review and they're saying things such as the plot makes no sense. and I don't like the fact that the game doesn't play out in order, but then you actually play the game yourself and you realize the reasons why, you know, like, first of all, there's no reason no one should understand the plot. It's not confusing. And the reason it's in that order is for a certain reason. It's because of a part of the game. So for them to make those negatives on the game, it's like, well, then you didn't get it. It's not that the game's bad. You didn't fucking get it. You weren't paying attention. Maybe you didn't catch the stuff. You just didn't get the game. All right? That doesn't mean the game's bad. It means that someone wasn't very attentive when they were playing the game. However, if you're the kind of person that plays games and you love heavy game, heavy interactivity, you like 
playing a game for hours on end so you're perfectionist with it and you like doing perfectionist speed runs and you like challenge, that's the one thing. This game is not challenging at all. It's not a game made to challenge you. It's a game made to entertain you with an interesting narrative. And that's really where the dichotomy comes. It's probably people who like challenging games versus people who just like entertaining games, all right? And that's really what I think the whole issue lies. So that's as much as I'm going to talk about it for now. I am going to review the game, as I said, later this week, probably Sunday, I'm thinking. I'm going to do a stream of content where I'm just going to be doing alternate scenarios to alternate endings to get all that stuff. We'll be doing that, and then I'm going to review the game. So that's coming up, and I'll give you my full thoughts plus my review score of the game coming up this week. Okay? All right, so that's it for the first segment of Hate Live. I hope you enjoyed it. Right now, I'm going to take a short break. Okay? I'm going to come back in a few minutes, and we're going to be doing the Back in the Day segment. This week is all about console history. I'm going to go through the history of the consoles that I've owned. I'm going to tell you about what I thought about them, you know, when they launched, the different features, the cool stuff about them, um, some of the faux pas, the quirks of these consoles, and what people thought about them when they were released. And uh, it's going to be basically an education regarding the history of gaming consoles since I've been a gamer. And I think it's going to be entertaining. So definitely check back here for back in the day after the break. So if you're watching this on Twitch TV, just hang in there. I'll be back in a few short minutes. If you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to go to the timestamp in the description of the video. Click on it to just jump right ahead and you can skip this break. Okay? So I'll be right back after these messages. I'll see you in a bit.
Okay, welcome to Back in the Day, the segment where I talk about my history as being a gamer, growing up with gaming, all kinds of different stuff, and today I'm actually going to be talking about the history of consoles that I've had experience with, starting with my very first one that I ever owned, all the way up to right now, obviously with modern consoles. And uh, just to see, you're going to see how I pretty much owned every major console that there was, with a few exceptions. Uh, during a period of my life where I really wasn't heavily into console gaming, I'll explain about that when we get to it. So first of all, I'm 31 years old, alright? When I was growing up, video gaming was for the very first time kind of leaving arcades, maturing a bit, and getting ported to home consoles, okay? And during the 1980s, really when you said video game, most people thought about things like uh, Pac-Man. Uh, Centipede, Galaga, we're talking these pixely arcade style games, alright? They weren't talking about these great amazing narrative experiences like we have today. They were very primitive back then, alright? And the very first console that I ever owned, I was given by my uncle, and it was actually not a multi-game console, because they actually had back then uh, the ability to, to get a single game kind of control that would plug into your TV and you'd be able to play a game. And they had different ones like tennis and things like that. I had Pong, the very original Pong. Now let me tell you, if you want to talk about a basic game, Pong is the most basic game probably ever created. All it is, I shit you not, this is Pong. A score here, a score here. So 0-0, zero, zero, all right? Two sticks that move up and down the sides of the screen and a fucking square that's supposed to be a ping pong ball that goes boop. Boop, 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 boop. That's it. There's no crowd. There's no menu. It's just, you know, turn it on. That's what you saw on your TV. And it was black and white. The black background was black. The letters, the sticks, and the square were white. The most simple thing you could possibly think for a video game. And it was actually funny because the way it worked, it actually, I'm trying to see if, if there's anything I have that's about the size of what it was. Actually, you know what? I'd probably say this iPad right here was about the size of what the controller for it was. And what it was, it was it was like this, but it was thick. It was like maybe this thick, okay? And it had two uh, knobs on top. And it had one button, two knobs. So you plug it in, push the button, the game would start, and you put it on your lap, and you just start turning the knobs to control the ping pong paddles, which were really just sticks. And so you had the two things going like this, back and forth, where boop, 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 and that would be it. In fact, the game never ended. You could go on infinitely. You just had to reset the whole thing if you wanted to reset the score. So really, there was no rules. It was just score. That was it. Um, the most basic thing you could possibly think of. And I actually remember I liked it as a kid. I played it with my dad. And I actually... It, the thing is, it was so basic. Back then with tube TVs, they had things that you really can't do. Like right now with my TV, I'm sure I've got a controller. But the controller, I can't fuck really with the color too much. You could. There's like different temperatures. But back then, they had a knob on all tube TVs called tint. And by turning that knob, you would actually change the color of your TV from, say, I don't know, some weird thing. In fact, you know what? I could give you a demo right now. This is pretty much what you could do. I could do it here with this. Uh... See this? Look, oh my god, now I'm green. Or, you know, you go all the way to the left. Oh no, now I'm purple. Like, that's what would happen. You would actually click on this button. And, uh... Let me go back to where I was. You click on this, or t turn this knob, it's a tint. It would change the tint of your TV. So I actually, I was, I got bored of it just being black and white. And so I would turn the tint on my TV to make a different color. So I had hot pink Pong. I had neon green Pong. I had blue Pong. So that was how primitive they were when I was a child, all right? Now, the very first real multi-game home game console that I owned was the Atari 7800. Now, the Atari has an interesting history. The Atari home console had three major iterations, all right? There was the Atari 2600, all right? And this was the, the, the line-level Atari. You could play, it was cartridge-based, and the car, I, I wish I had a cartridge here to show you what size they were. I don't have any anymore. They were cartridge based. You would just plug the cartridge into the top, pop, just like that. The controller was the most basic thing you could think of. It was a square. So picture this a square with a joystick coming out like this and one red button. And it would sit like this with the joystick and the one red button. And that's how you would play it. You just play it like this and you would push the button. And that was it. It was the most basic controller you could possibly think of one button, one joystick, 
no complexity to it. And so the games were also equally simplistic. However, it was funny how many classic games came out of the Atari 2600. Games like Moon Patrol, games such as Berserk, um, Defender. Uh, these were all pretty much ports of equally you know, basic pixely arcade games that were now being ported to the whole con home consoles for the very first time. But that being said, it didn't mean that there was only arcade ports. There were also completely original titles, such as there was actually a Ghostbusters movie tie-in game for the Atari. There were all kinds of things. Uh, uh, what was the name of the one? I'm thinking of Pitfall, uh, Jungle Hunt. I'm thinking of all these classic games that I had for the Atari, all right? That was the Atari 2600. Then they came out with the 5200, for which they doubled the size of the console. They had a controller that was faulty, wasn't compatible with the original Atari 2600, actually different kinds of pins, and the whole thing was just basically a mess. It basically barely worked. People hated it. It was more expensive. So then they came out with the best of both worlds, which was the Atari 7800. It was kind of like the high-level Atari console. You could still play tw Atari 2600 games on it if you wanted, but you should also play new, better graphical Atari 7800 games. And I had games like Food Fight and Ball Blazer, and Rampage, that's right, that game, the arcade game with the three big monsters that are Godzilla-like and they're climbing buildings and punching stuff, I had a Rampage for that system. And that system was definitely a huge graphical step up from the Atari 2600. But that was the first real home console that I had was the Atari 7800. But it was weird. And the reason I say it was weird was because, well, first of all, back then, no gaming consoles had stereo sound. They all had mono sound. So it was funny because a lot of TVs didn't have stereo sound back then. It was just one channel of sound. Um, but everything kind of sounded clouded and clunky, kind of like this. Everything kind of sounded like this coming out of the Atari. It just didn't sound very good. It sounded muffled like this. Like, unless there was a big high-pitched blip, then you would hear it like this. Blip. Blip. That's what it would sound like. And uh, the controller, oh my God, the controller they had for this thing, I don't know who in, like thought of this. All right, how can I fucking even describe it? It was such a weird controller. I'm trying to look for anything in my living room that's the shape of it. I can't even find anything because it was so fucking weird. All right, let me let me try to sh to at least show you. So it was long, unlike unlike a, the square controller of the Atari 2600. It was narrow. It was like maybe half the width of this, but it was long. So it was almost like holding a rectangular kind of a thing in your hand. And it had two buttons instead of one. So they said, oh, this is better now because there's two buttons. But the buttons were on top of the controller. All right. Picture it's a long rectangle. They were on the sides. So you actually couldn't control it like, like the old controller you would hold from the top and you push the button. You couldn't play it like that. Your left hand would hold the controller. Your thumb would push the left button. Your pointer finger would push the right button. You would actually use your hand to control the joystick which sat on top of it. Okay, so you would actually play games sideways when you played the Atari 7800. You play them like this rather than like this, which was really weird. I don't know what they were thinking with this controller. Now the problem was that the controller in the, its own design was innately flawed. Wait till you hear this. So the way the joystick, you would think, oh, a joystick, right? Just even look, look at a modern controller. Look how the joystick is, right? It's upright and it sits there and it's fine. The way that the joystick was in the Atari 7800 was that instead of having, you know how right here this is a ball, all right, it was sunken into the controller. So really what you had was a tall point, a tall joystick, but it had like only a gully in the controller. And the thing was infamous that after you just leave it out for a couple days, it would have a big dust buildup inside of the joystick well of the controller. Why they couldn't make it flat or have a protective covering or something, I have no idea. But it was just like really poorly designed. Every day, oh, we're gonna play Atari, you pick it up. Oh, you gotta get the dust bunnies off this fucking thing. So you gotta get cleaning solutions and shit to clean off your controller in order to play the game. It was really odd the way that they designed this controller, all right? So that was pretty much my very, very early console history. Now, the next console that I owned, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the Super, or, I'm sorry, the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, or I guess you call it the Famicom in uh, Japan. Now, the NES, for me, it blew me away. Because here's a system, it's versatile. 
It has a controller with a D-pad, not a joystick. It was the first gaming console I ever had that had this D-pad. And it really was the one that revolutionized the whole D-pad concept. That NES controller, the original NES controller, I actually have a fake one over here that I've been using. I used on PC, I think. There you go. The original NES controller, I mean, this D-pad, out of all the gaming consoles I've played in my life, and keep in mind, I've, I've, like I said, I'm 31 years old. I've been a gamer pretty much my whole life. The, I still have not found a fucking controller that's as responsive as the NES D-pad. I don't know what, what it was about it, but this D-pad was so versatile. You could use it for, for action games, for shooter games, for RPGs. It was just so good. It was responsive. I loved the NES D-pad. I don't know why. I just, I just loved it. Now, the buttons on the NES controller on the other hand, were hit or miss. It was weird, because I owned a few different NES controllers. Some of them worked fine. And then others I would use for, like, a few weeks, and the button would, like, wear out. I had one controller where the button I actually somehow loosened, and the spring shot the button off, out, off the controller. All right? So, I don't know what it was about the buttons of the NES controller, but the D-pad I absolutely freaking loved. All right? And the NES, I mean, let's face it, the wide variety of games that it had... The fact that for the first time ever, instead of having your cartridges exposed and plugging into the top of the system, they would slide into a compartment that would close and supposedly protect it from dust and other particulates. That was a cool concept. Um, of course, of course, this was the infamous era of people starting to rent games. And what people found out very shortly is that unfortunately, not everyone takes care of their games. And so you go to the rental store, you'd rent a game, You'd bring it home, you'd open the box, the game would be covered in gunk. You'd be like, what the fuck happened to this game? First of all, who, what was, what is this? I don't even know, I can't even recognize what this is on this cartridge that I rented. Is it gum? Is it puke? Is it fucking shit? What is this disgusting, sticky substance all over the cartridge? And then, of course, you'd put those in your system, and it would fuck up your system. And infamously, the infamous blinking yellow screen of death is what was the most dreaded thing that could happen to a person who owned the NES. Because a lot of the times, when you rented games or you were trading games with your friends, they would have dirt or particulates or whatever inside of them. You put them in your NES, it would c contaminate the slot inside of your NES, which was actually very difficult to clean. Now, what ended up happening was when this started happening, you get this blinky yellow screen, the game wouldn't boot, you couldn't play the games, and all of a sudden, these third-party companies jumped on this bandwagon. They said, oh... Rental games are now, it's like a big thing, so we're going to start making cleaning accessories for the NES and cleaning accessories for the cartridges. And I actually remember I had this one. It was a fake NES cartridge that you would get cleaning solution and put it on it, and you would put it into the NES and close it and let it sit there for like 10, 15 minutes, and then you would pull it out, and you would blow on it and try to dry it out. And what it was, it was like an alcohol kind of a solution that would try to clean the contact heads inside of the NES because once you got that yellow screen of death, you may never get another game to work with your NES, which was a major problem. Okay. Now, in addition to that, um, another problem with the NES, which a lot of people didn't know until years, years later, some people who still owned their original NES was that the the, 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 the the Nintendo Entertainment System had copy protection on it. It did. Um, that didn't stop people from finding ways around the copy protection, okay? But it had copy protection on it. And so what would happen is even if you were playing a legitimate Nintendo Entertainment System game in the Nintendo Entertainment System, as your system got older and older, the copy protection would malfunction and accidentally think that you were playing a bootleg game and it wouldn't boot the game for you. And most people today, in modern times, who have problems with their NES, it's two reasons why they can't get it to work. Number one, because the contact heads on the inside of the NES are still dirty, and they get that blinking screen of death, all right? Or number two, because the copy protection chip inside of their NES has malfunction, and the NES just will not legitimately think that any game is legit. Now, there's ways past this. If you actually buy a Game Genie, the Game Genie is a cartridge that you plug your cartridge into. So it's like a tower of cartridges going into your NES. The Game Genie was a way for you to cheat. If you had a game that was difficult uh, and you couldn't beat it legitimately, you could cheat. You could use cheat codes to have infinite lives, have infinite health, all right? Before those things were necessarily built into the games, the Game Genie could find ways around it and hack these games basically on the fly and allow you to cheat in the games. But the Game Genie 
bypass this copyright protection in order to do that. So a neat trick that you might want to do if you have an NES today that's not booting games properly is to buy a Game Genie. They're cheap. You can probably get it for 5 10 bucks somewhere and then plug the game into the Game Genie and then into the NES. In fact, that's how I actually did last year. Remember I did my... Uh, my Mega Man X Marathon, and the year before that, I did my Mega Man Marathons. That's how I played a lot of those games. They weren't working legitimately with my old consoles, but I used a Game Genie to bypass the copy protection issue, and I was actually able to play those consoles uh, with no problem. Okay? So, after... After... Oh, yeah, the Game Shark as well. There's also one called the Game Shark. There was the Game Shark and the Game Genie. Yes. And they both did exactly the same thing. All right? Um... After the NES was the Super NES. Now, the Super NES was a jump. Like, a big jump. Now, you can argue, okay, well, the jump from the Atari to the NES is a big jump. And in some cases, to, to, let's, let's be honest here, there were some games for NES that were quite simplistic. But then, of course, you look at a game like Super Mario Bros. 3, and you're like, holy shit, what a complex, amazing game that was. But the jump from NES to Super NES, you were now capable of having games that were, like, long as hell. Because you have so much storage capacity on the Super NES cartridge. They had chips that were there that you could do 3D rendering, such as Star Fox. They called it the FX chip, all right? You could do mode, I forget what they call it, mode 7 or whatever, which allows those things in the background to actually make the game have multiple layers and look like it's almost 3D. That was a new thing with the SNES. The amount of colors, I mean the amount of vibrant colors that the thing could run, but also... The sound, the sound on the Super NES was so amazing. It was a huge jump for a lot of people from NES to Super NES. Um, the controller, I loved, actually, I have one of those too I can show you. The Super NES controller was another huge step in progression for game consoles. Because take a look, they doubled the amount of face buttons, all right? The D-pad was about the same. In fact, I would say it's probably about on par with the one on the NES controller. But for the very first time, you had, that's right, shoulder buttons. And it was actually funny because the Sega Genesis was out the same time as the Super NES. And the Sega Genesis controller was far inferior. It only had three buttons. It had no shoulder buttons. And it severely limited the controls you could have for certain games because it only had three freaking buttons on it. So what they ended up doing later on was the, Sega basically realized, damn, our controller's outdated. They made another controller that was a six-button controller, official controller, and they kind of copied off of the Super NES controller. They had shoulder buttons and all the same shit that this one has. So it's funny that this kind of created the archetype. I mean, even look. Here we are. Here's the modern Wii U Pro controller, and look at how similar it actually is. It's got the same four face buttons, it's got the same D-pad, it's got the same shoulder buttons, really all they did was add triggers and added thumbsticks, but it's almost the same controller. So here we are, what, over 20 years later, and we're using almost the same damn controller that we did 20 years ago. So this really was revolutionary for its time. It really pushed out the capabilities of what a home console could do with video games. Okay. Now, the Super NES was good. Super NES really... Uh, for my opinion, for that, that, that era of it was always Super NES versus Sega Genesis, I thought the Super NES was far superior. Graphically, uh, music, the music of the games, and the, 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 the games. Let me tell you, they had some of the best, uh, of course, all the first party Nintendo titles were absolutely amazing, but now talk about the third party support they had. Square Enix, before they were Square Enix, they were just Square back then who was making all of the those classic Final Fantasy, Secret of Mana, Chrono Trigger, Earthbound was a console exclusive. Role-playing games flourished on the Super NES. Don't get me wrong. On the Sega Genesis, there were some good ones you had. I think it was uh, uh, Lunar, um, Fantasy Star. It had some, but the ones on the Super NES just fucking took the cake. The, the amazing things they did with the graphics and stuff at the time. Were just it was amazing these great narrative adventures but of course action games you had Con super con or super not super c uh contra 3 you had super castlevania you had all these games that were just they blew you away with these graphical improvements and uh new gameplay kind of uh, mechanics super super metroid was was a good one good example okay now the sega genesis i did have but i got it much later i actually got the sega genesis probably the midway through its run. And the reason is because 
Like I said, I had an NES, and so progressively I just wanted the Super NES. I didn't want the Genesis at the time. But a lot of kids at school who I knew actually had a Sega Genesis, and they didn't have a Super Nintendo. So they would tell me about, wow, you didn't play Sonic the Hedgehog. You didn't play Toe Jam and Earl. You didn't play this or that exclusive game. And then, of course, the big thing that kind of made me, sold me on the Genesis was one of the fighting games came out in Mortal Kombat on the SNES had no blood. And I know that sounds real stupid, but Mortal Kombat was like the quintessential gory video game. A game with no blood for what it, for Mortal Kombat with no blood or gore, that's not Mortal Kombat. And I wanted to play the real Mortal Kombat, so I ended up eventually getting the Sega Genesis and getting the real Mortal Kombat for Sega Genesis, okay? Uh also, uh, there, there were a lot of good console exclusives for Genesis. I, I'm, I'm obviously I'm not remembering them all. It's simply because, you know, it's been so long. I think the X-Men, there was an X-Men game for Genesis that was absolutely outstanding too, if I remember correctly. X -Men, actually, yeah, there was X-Men 1 and 2 that were console exclusives for Genesis, and they were really fucking good. I remember those. Um, and the Genesis, for what it was, was actually neat. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, the controller for the Genesis was, was just outdated. By the time that that controller came out, it was like, you knew SNES was right around the corner. SNES had such a great idea with their controller that the Genesis ended up being so limited that, like I said, later on, later on it was funny. When you would buy the console new, they took out the old controller and put in a six button. So you couldn't even, like, get the original Genesis controller after a certain amount of time because they realized it was so outdated. Um, but the console was pretty much exactly... It's a console. It was a top loader. Similar to SNES was also a top loader. This was a top loader. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't have the capabilities of the SNES. The graphics were inferior. The sound was inferior. But it had some really good first-party titles that let it have a lot of longevity. Okay? Now, at the time of all this going on, I did not own the Sega CD, nor did I own the Sega 32X. I knew people who had them, but I didn't have enough money to constantly be buying add-ons for the consoles, all right? After the Super NES and the Genesis, the next jump for me was the Nintendo 64. So I missed that era of the, the, the Sega CD and the 32X, but you guys have seen, if you are, if you are you know, uh, you know, long-time viewers of mine, you've seen over the years, I've played games on the Sega 32X, on the Sega CD, you've seen what they are, and nine times out of ten, they're shit. Those things were just peripherals that were dreamt up by Sega because they just didn't want to make a new console and they wanted to basically try to extend the life of the Genesis without making a new console. And it's just, there's no way without designing a new console from the ground up that you're going to make that console, that outdated console, stand up to the PlayStation and the Nintendo 64. It didn't make sense. The, the direction that Sega was taking didn't really make sense and it was just a complete waste of their time in my opinion. And a lot of money. Let's face it, they sunk a lot of money into the development of the Sega CD. And look at the, the, the stupid Tom Zito games with full motion video. Where Think of how much money they must have sunk into Tom Zito to make him develop those games. And they all fucking flopped. So, a huge faux pas for Sega there. So, the next console that I actually owned was the Nintendo 64. Now, this was the era of the battle between staying... <clears throat> staying with the old or moving on to a brand new technology. So let me explain. It was announced that there was going to be a next generation of consoles. And Nintendo originally said that they were going to make a console that was CD-based. And they weren't going to develop the CD drive. They were actually going to have Sony develop a CD drive for their console. So they would basically buy these CD drives from Sony and install them into their console. Halfway through the development of this thing, someone internal at Nintendo decided they changed their mind. They weren't going with the CD drive anymore. And Sony basically said, what the fuck? What gives? We're already working. We're already developing this. You told us to develop it. What, what's going on? And Nintendo said, oh, well, we're backing out tough titties. So Nintendo went off and decided to make the Nintendo 64. Now, originally, this thing was supposed to be called the Ultra 64. And it was plagued with development problems. Basically, here was the problem. Nintendo said they wanted to go with cartridges over discs, CDs. However, it, it just ran them up the ass with production problems. Number one, cartridges were way more expensive to produce than CDs. Think about it. The CD is a CD. You put it in a CD drive, it boots. It's cheap. It's inexpensive. You know what I mean? It's replaceable. A cartridge has all this intricate technology inside. It's got microchips. It's got circuit boards. It's got all this shit that makes it expensive to manufacture. So that was number one. Number two, cartridges actually had significantly less space inside of them to store data. 
So you could store way more data on a CD than you could on a cartridge. And what ended up happening was a lot of game development studios who normally had had these partnerships with Nintendo said, we're sorry, our creative vision for our games is far past the technology that you're providing us with your console. We're jumping ship. And that's what happened when major studios such as Squaresoft left Nintendo and made Final Fantasy VII for the Sega, I'm sorry, for the Sony PlayStation. And what I'm getting at here, Nintendo eventually, after two years of developing this console, it was supposed to come out in, like, I think 1995 or something like that. It ended up coming out way, way later because it got so many development problems and things. The thing finally came out. It was cartridge-based, and it had a controller that looked hideous. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there, and I'm going to officially say this. I don't know if other people will agree or disagree with me. I think the Nintendo 64 controller was the most poorly developed controller I've ever used. And what I mean by that, it just had no vision at all of what it wanted to be. It was so confused. It had a thumbstick that, unlike today, wasn't in the cent and the sides. It was in the center. So when you hold this controller, you had to hold the center of the controller with your left hand to use your thumb. And your right hand would kind of be crooked like this trying to reach the buttons, but then there were games that didn't use the thumbstick, they used the D-pad. So now you were holding the controller like this to get the D-pad over here and the buttons over here, and it was like a monstrosity to behold. I don't know what they were thinking with that controller. It's basically like they had ideas, but they couldn't figure out how to ergonomically fit the ideas into a functional controller. So some games excelled. You play Super Mario 64, the game was amazing. Then you would try to play it like a, a, a different game that really might not fit that style, and it was terrible. And it was actually that era where fighting games no longer came out for Nintendo. There was one game, Killer Instinct 2, that got ported to the Nintendo 64. After that, most fighting games weren't ported, or if they were, people hated them. Like, they had Mortal Kombat... Uh, I think it was Mortal Kombat Trilogy came out for Nintendo 64, and people complained like crazy that they couldn't play it. They're like, it's so hard to control on this fucking controller. All I want is a regular controller. This is what I want, and they didn't make them. So it was just like such a poorly designed controller. Now, at the, near the same time that Nintendo 64 came out, Sony took all that development they had already been spending money on for Nintendo, and Nintendo Jump Ship, they made their own console called the Sony PlayStation, all right? The Sony PlayStation was revolutionary. Absolutely. That console took us into the next generation. All right. Number one, with graphics. For the very first time, you were able to do full motion video. And you might say, what does that mean? It means it's a pre-rendered cutscene, basically. There was pre-rendered cutscenes for the very first time. They weren't on the fly generated in the game engine. They were developed previously and then just literally just read like a movie file and played on your TV. Finally, they could fit these on the game disc because the game disc has such a high data capacity and so those were able to be played on your TV for the first time, okay? Just the length of games. Some games, you know, some games had to be limited when it was on a cartridge. Now, you could have games that were just so long uh, because you had so much storage capacity on the CDs. And let's face it, the PlayStation 1 was the, the launching of so many classic franchises. I remember back then, uh, Crash Bandicoot, um, Resident Evil, obviously, still had had its start there. Uh, Twisted Metal, it was things that you never think you could do before. Three D rendered stuff in an open open world environments where you could move around. Previously, it was all two D. Everything was two D. Everything the console generation before was two D. Finally, they could move into the three D realm. Now, not to say that the Nintendo 64 didn't do that, because absolutely it did, with games like Super Mario 64, as I previously said, Star Fox 64, which blew me the fuck away when I played it. I couldn't believe how good it was, the production values on it, Zelda, Ocarina of Time, and Majora's Mask. So it had, it also had its th fully 3D games that were great, but it, it was funny, because the flip side of that was that there were other games that were 2D games on there, because basically those developers didn't have anywhere to go. No one wanted to play 2D games anymore, because it was all about 3D. That was the new fad. 3D, 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 3D. And that's where I really feel that some game studios fell off. Like, for example, Squaresoft with Final Fantasy VII. I honestly don't think that game was as good as Final Fantasy IV and VI, but because it was the first one on PlayStation with 3D graphics, people just fucking nutted themselves over it. Oh, it's Final Fantasy with 3D? Fuck it, it's the best game ever made. And I'm like, I really don't think so. I think the plot of 4 and 6 were better. I think the characters of 4 and 6 were better. The graphics of this are obviously awesome because they're 3D, but that's not what makes a game. But I think it kind of got caught up in that mania, okay? Now, 
Here's the thing. First of all, the PlayStation 1 debuted this style of gamepad. However, it did not have... That's right. At first, the PlayStation 1 didn't have the dual thumbstick layout that we have today. It actually started out as just a gamepad, D-pad, with your four face buttons and your triggers. And that was it. It was later on that new games wanted to have this 3D motion, or this 3D range of motion that the Nintendo 64 had with its gamepad and its thumbstick. And so they made us oh, basically like a Wave 2 controller that actually had the full 3D controls. And so later on, they added this button to actually say digital and analog. Do you want to use this or do you want to use this when you play the games? Because you have the option to switch between them on the fly. Okay? So uh, that was interesting. However, <clears throat> however, this was probably the first console I ever owned that innately there were hardware design problems. The very first wave, and even initially after that, I believe it was two waves of manufactured PS3s had a problem, all right? The problem was the thing he heated up like a fucking oven. It was the first, again, the first home console, really, that was primarily based on rotating a disc to read it. And so if you're playing a game for four hours straight, that thing would become fucking hot as hell. And what would happen is the system would overheat, and as it overheated, there was actually an adhesive that was on the lens for the laser to read the disc. The adhesive would actually melt because it heated up so much, and it would actually cause the lens to vibrate. And so you'd be playing your game, and all of a sudden, it would freeze up, and you'd hear it just go... It would be trying to read the disc, and it wouldn't be able to because the lens was vibrating like this, and it couldn't catch the data because it was moving too much because the adhesive had melted. So an entire generation of people who bought the PS1, after a few months, had consoles that would almost never load unless it was, like, freezing cold in your house. So what they ended up doing was they, they, they invented solutions for this, all right? And it's funny because the original PlayStation 1 was designed to always be laid flat. What people discovered is that if you used gravity to your advantage, you could load your game. So what they would do, instead of playing it flat like this, they would take their consoles and stand them on their side. And by doing that, the force of gravity would actually force the lens downward and force it to stay more steady. And it would actually load your games easier. So there were people who would flip them their, their, their consoles completely over. They would have them angles like this. They would try to get it just to fucking load the disc. And then finally, they ended up releasing later on, uh, a, a, like I think it was the third wave of PS1s, they fixed the adhesive issue and the lenses didn't melt anymore. So they eventually did fix the problem, but it was funny because so many people had this problem. Everyone's, it would be funny, you go over to your friend's house, he'd have some fucking crazy rig with fucking bungee cords and shit trying to hold his PlayStation in a weird position so that would boot his game and not skip. Really fucking weird. Um, Alright, so the next generation of consoles were the Sega Saturn, and the Sega Dreamcast, all right? Now, the Saturn was kind of released alongside in there somewhere with the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation 1, and the Saturn was probably one of the worst launches ever for a console because remember what I had told you. Sega was trying to stay afloat with the Sega CD, with the Sega 32X, so there were people who, had, who were Sega fanboys. They had invested all this money into Sega hardware, okay? And the next thing you know, holy shit, a year later, they come out with the Saturn, which is a brand new console. And you're like, what the fuck? I just sunk all that money into the Sega CD, into this stupid mushroom top fucking thing, 32X for the Genesis, and now you're abandoning all that to put out a new console? And it was really kind of an uproar against Sega, saying, fuck you, you're not being fair to your customer base, we invested all this money, you told us this was the future of gaming, now you're abandoning it for a new console so soon, fuck you, we're gonna go with someone else. And so the Sega Saturn flopped in the United States. Most people didn't buy it, those that did had a very limited title line. Now, it's funny, though, because I did own one. I actually went, before the Dreamcast ever came out, I remember, I actually remember this, I had gone to Toys R Us one day to buy um, something else, all right? And I walked into Toys R Us, and they said Saturn Blowout. Sega Saturn prices slashed. You want to know why? Because they had just announced the Dreamcast. So the Saturn had such a limited run in the United States. Only I think it was like a year to a year and a half, really. It really never picked up steam. And then the next console was already coming out. So they said, that's it. We're basically giving them away. I think I left that day. I left the store with a Sega Saturn, Guardian Heroes, um, a Fantasy Star game, 
uh, one or two of the best RPG uh, strategy style games for the system. And there was another one too. So I looked over like five or six games in the console for under a hundred bucks. Because they were just trying to get rid of the fucking thing. They wanted it gone. They wanted it out of their stores. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> I actually had a Saturn, and the Saturn controller, for all intents and purposes, was amazing. The Saturn controller, I believe, if I remember correctly, had six buttons on the front. So, for the first time, for fighting games, you had a six-button controller with all the buttons on the front of the controller. You could actually play it similar to how you would play the game in an arcade in a six-button layout. And it was funny because the Saturn was more well-known for its Japanese ports of fighting games than for much anything else. It actually had almost arcade-perfect ports of games such as X-Men vs. Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter because it utilized, that's right, an expansion port. The, the Saturn ran on CDs but had an expansion port for cartridges. And you could buy cartridges to do different things. Some cartridges you would save your game. Some of them was a RAM. It actually added RAM so that games would run better. And that's actually what I had. I had this generic import RAM cartridge and I would put it in there and through a mod modification method on my Saturn, I could play Japanese fighting games with this mo this RAM cartridge, and they ran amazing. They were great. They were almost arcade perfect, like I said. And with the six-button controller, it was awesome. It was like having the arcade experience at home for the first time. <clears throat> the next generation was the Dreamcast, all right? The Dreamcast was, a lot of people would say it was ahead of its time, all right? came out around the year 1999 to 2000. It was the first console to have built-in networking capabilities, meaning it had a modem in it. It actually did have a modem in the thing. And you, you could hook it up to the phone line. Back then, keep in mind, there were no cable modems. You would hook it up to the phone line, and the, you would be able to dial into this Sega network, and you'd be able to do things like, I think there was like, you, you could do emails and things like, very primitive things. Now in Japan, in Japan, you could actually play games online with the Dreamcast. But we didn't have the capability or the infrastructure in the United States to do that, so we never got to implement that online gameplay feature of the Dreamcast, all right? The Dreamcast had, again, a step up in graphics from the PlayStation. It kind of jumped ahead of the PlayStation almost. Um, the controller was weird. Admittedly, I'm going to say the controller for the Dreamcast was kind of weird. It was, instead of a smaller pad like this, it was big. It was kind of clunky almost. It was lightweight. It didn't weigh a lot, but it was clunky. It had the four face buttons. It had shoulder buttons, but it had a D it had this, the thumbstick, but also had a D pad, but it was like really tall almost like wide. I don't know why they did that with the design of it. And for the very first time they had what was called a VMU. So this was a hybrid. Previous consoles, either it saved your game on the game cartridge, or if you were CD-based, you have to buy a separate memory card to save your games. This one had what was called a VMU. It was basically the combination of a Tamagotchi and a memory card. Now, a lot of you have no fucking idea what a Tamagotchi is, because this was a fad that lasted like two years and completely died out. Tamagotchis were these little, little games, very, very small, probably the size of a pack of Tic Tacs, okay, with a little LED screen, and pixely graphics, and it would have basically it would be a virtual pet that you would raise by touching, oh, give it food, tickle it or whatever, make a cute sound, and it was it was really a fat. It died out, but they made this thing that was a, a tamagotchi that you could do that with certain games, like your save file. You would save to this memory card that had an LED screen on it. You could then take it out and go do tasks and shit with it outside of the game, and then plug it back into the game, and it would affect the game. But very few games really utilized it. It was again. In Japan, it was big. In Japan, it was a huge hit. In America, really, it didn't catch on, and there weren't a lot of games that utilized it, all right? Um, the Dreamcast was huge when it came to fighting games. When it came... Street Fighter 3, Third Strike, Capcom vs. SNK, uh, 1 and 2, um, Marvel vs. Capcom, 1 and 2. This was the only console where you could get definitive versions of those games. They did have PlayStation 2 ports of many of them, but they were inferior. The Dreamcast version of those games were the best ones. And this was the big fad where people finally started buying giant fighting game joysticks for their consoles because you finally had ar nearly arcade perfect ports and those were the actual versions of the games that were played in tournaments. I remember Marvel vs. Capcom 2, Third Strike, CVS 2. Those were the big three that were always played on Dreamcast and I had this giant fucking thing called a Moss Stick that I had for my Dreamcast that I could plug it in and play with six buttons and a giant thing. It was the very first console where 
people would do that, all right? However, also, it had other iconic titles like Power Stone, like Shenmue, Crazy Taxi. There was a whole slew of games for the Dreamcast that were amazing. And so the console, people said, they said it's ahead of its time. It had these features, it built into it, like this Tamagotchi thing, the internet, that later on would become standard, or like, like the, the internet thing especially, would become a standard feature of a console, but at the time it wasn't ready. The times weren't ready for it. Technology wasn't there yet. Um, however, there was something infamously wrong with the Dreamcast, and it was that the port, the control port, so the actual place where you'd plug in your controllers, were very, they, the, the, I believe it was a, either a fuse or the grounding of it, something was wrong with it, that after you, for, let me, if for, after you plug in a controller a certain amount of times, or if you kind of jam a controller in, you could blow the whole port out, and I had, I owned multiple Dreamcasts, because my friends all had joysticks, we all had joysticks that we would switch between games, uh, that multiple times, the ports on my Dreamcast would blow out, because of a short, and this happened with many Dreamcasts, it's actually funny, because later on, they just started selling, the control port portion, they had do-it-yourself guides online, how to repair your broken Dreamcast, because so many people had this issue. And it's funny, because to this day, you can almost never find a fully functional Dreamcast, because most of them had this problem. Eventually, at one point in its life, the, the ports blew out, and people just gave up on them and threw them out. And now to finish up, let's just... let's. I'll bridge the ending here, because let's face it, everyone knows what the PS2 looks like. Remember, there were two models of PS2. The big chubby PS2 and the PS2 Slim. This was the first console where they started doing that kind of stuff. It was, the, I believe, the first one that had the built-in rumble. I don't believe the PlayStation 1 controller had the built-in rumble, but the PlayStation 2 controller did. So that was a jump in technology. Obviously, the graphical capabilities of the PlayStation 2. Yes, the PlayStation 2, you could buy a modem for it. Later on, the Slim had a modem built in for it, even though the online capabilities still were very limited. I, I remember that game Resident Evil Outbreak that everyone touted, oh, it's online play with Resident Evil, it's going to be great. And because everyone's internet sucked back then, the game was terrible. <laughs> it was really funny. Um, but the one interesting thing that I want to mention, isn't it funny that the PlayStation 1 had an issue with the lens, where the, the, like I said, the adhesive would melt. Okay, but isn't it funny that the PlayStation 2, they intentionally sold a stand so you could put your PS2 vertically rather than horizontally. It's almost like they were afraid that the same thing would happen, even though they hadn't anticipated it, that the same thing would happen with the PS2, and they were trying to, t to sell you on standing your PS2 vertically just in case the adhesive melted so the lens would still work. I thought that was kind of funny. I was like, gee, I, I my PS1 looked like what this PS2 is, is made designed to be standing like because I had to do it to get even get the damn thing to work, even though that wasn't the intention back then. And then, of course, as you know, uh, the PS2 had an amazing library of games, and this was the era that I really missed out on. The PS2 GameCube era was the era that I really missed out on. The only reason I owned the PS2 was to play fighting games. I played, again, uh, Street Fighter III Third Strike, uh, Capcom vs. SNK 2, and there were many different iterations of uh, Street Fighter, meaning like Street Fighter Super Turbo, that were on the PlayStation 2 that I played. I missed out on that era of gaming. I didn't play all these classic titles, and that's why you see me now experiencing them for the first time. Kingdom Hearts and Silent Hill and Sly Cooper and all these iconic games, Devil May Cry. I skipped because I was so heavily into fighting games at the time. So really, I can't speak to those library lines simply because I didn't have them. And then, of course, now moving into the... I didn't own the GameCube at all. And then moving into the modern era, I don't think I need to really talk about the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. We've all experienced them. The woes of the Xbox 360 and its red ring fucking debacles. Um, <clears throat> the problems with PlayStation and PlayStation Network getting hacked. Xbox Live being down. We all know the woes that have happened with these, these modern consoles. And I don't need to get into them. Of course, they're about to not be modern consoles anymore. In just a short month, we're going to have the new slew of consoles, which means all new great gaming experiences, maybe new revolutionary jumps with the controller, with graphics, with storage, and I'm sure we're going to get our own share of new hiccups and problems that we're going to have with these new consoles as well. It's inevitable, okay? All right, so that's my Back in the Day segment. I hope you enjoyed it. That was a solid half hour of just informative stuff for you guys, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed either taking a, a, a romp through memory lane with me or maybe if this is the first time you heard about a lot of those consoles and the experiences people had with them. So hopefully that was uh, entertaining for you. So now I'm going to take a break. 
and I'm going to come back and we're going to do stream Q&A. So if you're watching this on Twitch, this is your last chance to submit a question for the stream Q&A raffle. Do it now during this break, okay? And when we come back, I'm going to pick a few questions. And then, as I said, if you're watching this on Twitch, afterwards we're going to take a look at P-Dog's cool montage video. If you're watching this on YouTube, the link is in the description. You can check it out right now. So I'll be right back. If you're watching this on Twitch, there's going to be commercial break. If you're watching this on YouTube, check out the description of the video for the timestamp. You can jump right to the Q&A section right now, okay? Thanks, everyone. I'll be right back. Okay, what is up everybody? Welcome back to the third and final segment of Hate Live for this week. And now we're going to turn it over to the stream. 
where I would ask if we could please put the stream into subscriber only mode. I'm sorry, the stream chat into subscriber only mode, and we will draw a few select questions. I'm actually not going to do this segment for too long this week simply because I want to have some time to screen P Dog's video here on the stream if we're watching this live on Twitch. So uh, let's go ahead and turn it over. We'll probably do like maybe five or something. So let's see what we've got. Let's go ahead and draw the first question. <clears throat> All right, the first question is from WizKid247, and he says they have a new Godzilla movie coming out. Are you going to watch it now? Uh, that's a good question because actually I have been following along with this new Godzilla. Just a few days ago I took a look at a website that has some of the pictures of what it's going to look like, and basically what they're saying is this is the serious Godzilla movie. This is the movie that if you like Godzilla as a character, this is the one you want to uh, watch. Now, I forget who the actors are that are in it, but I believe it is two good actors. I read I, who it was. Fuck. I read and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm pleased with that casting. But now I can't for the life of me remember who the hell it is that they cast for this movie. Um, but it looks good. And basically they said, this is going to make up for that horrendous fucking 1999 supposed Godzilla reboot that they made that was terrible. That had fucking Matthew Broderick as the main character. What a fucking joke that was. But uh, I'm interested in seeing it. I'm not saying that I'm going to see it. I'm just saying that I'm interested in seeing it. Eventually I will see it. And I'm excited because I like Godzilla. And to see him get rebooted I'm, since Final Wars there hasn't been a movie, I'm excited for that. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Mexican Duck. And he says... Uh, Phil, are you going to watch Willem Dafoe get schlong in the new movie Nymphomaniac? And the answer is absolutely. There's never an opportunity that I have to see Willem Dafoe schlong where I'd miss it. That thing, like they have to actually get panoramic 3D cameras to actually film it because the thing is like a giant... F no, I'm just kidding. Let's go to the next question. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Based Shawnee Coon, and he asks, do I have Asperger's? Uh, no, but I probably have assholeism. Or some kind of a horrible disease like that. Oh, uh, the next question is from Lost Wheat. And he says, what happened between you and Combo Fiend? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. You may be talking about the infamous story of uh, when I was at Evo on Combo Fiend's 21st birthday. Uh, I'm not going to be revealing that story tonight because that is for another time. Maybe, one, maybe uh, uh, you know, for back in the day, I'll start some Evo stories because I've got a bunch uh, that I could share with you guys. And, uh, you know, I, that might be something that I say for the future. As Outside of that, I never had a problem with Combo Fiend, so I'm not sure if what you mean. I have no idea. Um, let's see. Let's see. Next question is from Jelsey, and he actually asks, Phil, I noticed that you capture in 1280 by 720 resolution with computer monitors doing 1920 by 1080, uh... Hold on, I it scrolled off the screen because everyone was talking. Uh, basically, with, with computer monitors doing 1080p or higher, do you think that it's time to up your resolution that you're streaming capture at? The answer is absolutely not, uh, for multiple reasons. The first reason is because console games right now, most of them still render at 720p. Now, with the next console generation in a month, we may see this might change. Mo maybe games will actually start to render natively in 1080p. If that's the case, that may be more incentive for me to eventually stream and capture in 1080p, all right? In addition to that, right now, YouTube butchers 1080p videos. I'm going to say that again. YouTube butchers 1080p videos. Let me give you some perspective. You can record a video in 720p and 1080p and upload them both to YouTube. They'll pretty much look the same because YouTube has its own you know, uh, converter, whatever you want to call it, that basically allows that video to work on YouTube. And what I've noticed is that it just destroys the quality of 1080p videos. First of all, if you have anything that's above 30 frames per second, YouTube won't play it above 30 frames per second. So it makes it look worse. Number two, the resolution doesn't look as crisp. I don't know what YouTube does to 1080p videos, but I've had 1080p videos that look amazing on my computer monitor. I upload them and they look like standard videos on YouTube, and I don't know what it is. It's whatever their bullshit is that they use, it lowers the quality of the video. So for direct capture, there's no reason to do 1080p for things I'm uploading to YouTube because it won't look any better, all right? Now, 
the other thing, the other flip, the other portion of this is that currently Twitch TV only allows you to broadcast in three qualities. All right. Right now I've got three. I've got 360p, which is low. I've got 480p, which is medium. And I've got full 720p, which is supposed to be high. Now, of course, they say best or source, but that's supposed to be the same as high. Okay. Um, I would have to get rid of one of those in order to stream in 1080p. That's the rules. You only get three qualities you can stream on on Twitch. Now, is it fair for a very few, small few people who want to stream at full 1080p for me to take away the lowest quality video? You know what I mean? That's not fair. A lot of people don't have good internet. Is that their fault? No, because their, their area doesn't support faster internet because they can't watch my streams. So at this point, I really don't have much of a desire to move to 1080p but if twitch changes things in the future and they say okay well now because more people want to do 1080p we'll do it then maybe i'll do it it's unclear right now with the ps4 and xbox one what resolution those are going to stream on on twitch no one's really even knows yet so we'll see next month when i get those consoles what resolution is that able to stream at when you actually stream on twitch and uh who knows we'll have to see what happens in the future but right now i have no plans to go to 720p Um, let's see. Do we have any more quite uh ooh from Neverjob, who is my celebrity sex fantasy? Um uh probably uh Bill Murray. Bill Murray, uh <laughs> Yes, um let's see, who else? Who else would be my celebrity sex fantasy? Uh Clooney. Clooney, of course, is everyone's pick. I'm not I'm not a Brad Pitt guy, I'm a Clooney guy. Uh <laughs> <laughs> what a dumb question! All right, let's add, let's do two more questions, and then we're gonna we're gonna end the show. Let's see here. <clears throat> Ooh, now now you're now you're asking me the tough ones. All right, you're asking me the tough ones. I don't know if I'm ready for these yet. This question is from Jazz Fuentes09, and he asks, "Do you like Heavy Rain or Beyond Two Souls more?" First of all, I can't answer that question yet because I haven't gone back to Beyond Two Souls to experience the additional ways to do the missions and also to see the alternate endings. So without seeing that, I don't have the complete view of the game and I can't answer the question yet. What I can tell you is this. They are... Quantic Dream found a way to use the same style and formula to create two very, very different games. One was a realistic murder mystery, the other being a supernatural thriller. And even though they're different, one is the narrative of four different characters, the other is the narrative of pretty much only one during different time periods. I thoroughly enjoyed the stories of both games. Ultimately, I don't know what my decision is going to be when I pick which game I like better, but I have to think, like I said, I have to experience the rest of Beyond Two Souls before I legitimately give an answer to that question. You'll find out in my review coming this week. Okay. All right, and... Uh, oh, my God. The next question is from Supru. Sup oh my God, Suprome, or maybe it's supposed to be Supreme, but spelled oddly. And he asks, "What's better, the Super NES or the Genesis?" Well, that's an interesting question. It all depends on your perspective. I owned the Super NES first, the Genesis second. I thought the graphics and <clears throat> the music on the Super NES and the controller by far were better. That doesn't mean that the Genesis didn't have its own unique line of games. For me, I can't legitimately answer the question of what's better because I had the Super NES way before I got the Genesis late in the game. So for my personal experience, I like the SNES better. But I'm not definitively saying the SNES was the better console. It really depends on your perspective. Okay. Um, all right. Let's do... Everyone, let's do one more question. Last question of the night, I promise. Let's do it. One more. Ooh. This one is from Meek Triple G. And he asks, ladies and gentlemen, what is the hardest classic game I've ever played? Whew. Um, Ninja Gaiden is a mother bitch because once you die in the final stage, you have to replay the whole fucking game. Or the whole fucking final stage. If you remember, I beat Ninja Gaiden 2. I never beat the original Ninja Gaiden. I have it. I couldn't beat it. Because I was not going to continuously replay that whole final stage over and over and over. That game is fucking hard, man. Um, I'm trying to remember some examples of other classic games that I didn't beat or that I gave up on. I remember this one game. <clears throat> excuse me. 
there was a shooter that I bought called Abadox. And I remember if you didn't cheat, if you didn't use cheat codes to beat it, that game was fucking nearly impossible. It had like the, these weird corridors that were oddly shaped with, with fucking intestines and tentacles and shit. And you had to perfectly go through it without ever touching it. But there was shit flying at you. I just remember it being so incredibly hard. I was so disappointed because I bought the game. It was actually a choice between Abadox, and I seen a commercial for it, which is why I wanted to get it, or a new Mega Man game. And I bought fucking Abadox like a dumb shit, and I couldn't beat it. So I had to cheat to beat it. I just thought that game was really fucking hard. Um... I'm just trying to think if there's another one that stands out for me. Right now, there's nothing that's really sticking out saying, man, that was an incredibly hard classic game. P trust me, there were plenty of games that I never beat. Because when the rental when the rental business was huge, I used to, every weekend, I, not every weekend, it was actually more like once or twice a month, my mom uh, or our family, we would go to the, the supermarket. And the supermarket had a video game rental place inside of it. And I, she would let me rent a game. Uh basically once every time what we went shopping and so about twice a month i would actually try out new games for a few days and uh and i played some i played a lot i played a lot and i probably played a bunch of the tough ones but unfortunately you know it's been so long the the real one that sticks with me is ninja gaiden i can't believe that that you have to play replay the entire final fucking stage from start to finish just to get to the boss have a chance to fight him he's incredibly tough and if you just happen to lose while you're learning how to fight him you have to replay the entire fucking stage that is insanity insanity wow all right well everyone that is it for hate live i thank you for joining me uh <clears throat> for joining me for this uh this uh episode there will be no episode next week. As I said earlier in this video, we're actually going to next week. I'll be busy with Panda Lee. We'll be doing some stuff. However, there may be footage next week of a horror-themed game that we're going to do co-op in. All right. However, outside of that, there will be no no Hate Live. I'll be returning in two weeks. And in two weeks' time, it's going to be the build-up for Arkham Origins. Because that's right. There's going to be a, a midnight release for Batman Arkham Origins. So the Hate Live stream will literally be the build-up for Batman Arkham Origins. So that's going to be a great stream. And, of course, back in the day, any gaming news, we're going to return in two weeks. And I hope it's going to be a good one for you. So thanks a lot, everyone, for watching the Hate Live Beta podcast. I, I remind you, if you're watching right now on Twitch TV, stick around. Immediately following the end of the podcast, we're going to be previewing P-Dog's cool montage video of old school DSP. If you're not watching, if you're watching this on YouTube, the link is right there in the description of the video. Go ahead and click it and give it a look, okay? Thanks a lot, everyone, for Hate Live Beta Podcast. This is DSP signing off. Have a good night, and I'll see you soon.